So, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School for the last day of January in 2021. Can you believe 2020 is already a month behind us? Um, it is February tomorrow. And I was al almost, well, no, maybe I did say that. Yeah, I did. Our, our table talk question, I kind of like sometimes varying between something that's like theological and, and maybe a little heavy or challenging, and then something that's just very lighthearted and not really not anything to do with the lesson, but just it helps us build connections. So Valentine's Day is coming up. So I want you to be thinking about a, a, a memorable Valentine's Day time uh, or just, you know, something you, it could be a childhood, it could be recent, anything. But I ask that selfishly because, you know, I'm a husband who needs ideas on what, what to do. Uh, so anyway, today's lesson is going to be a slight, a slight bit different. This last week, I had a chance to share a chapel talk at our school on the topic of Jesus and science. And our, um, I guess his official title is our vicar, uh, Father Humans. You know, we can, we're connected on Facebook and he's aware of things that I've been doing. And we've talked a little bit about this class and I visited with him even I think as I was getting started with it. And so anyway, I did the preparation for that and I thought, well, I'll, I'll share that with, with us and, uh, and we can visit about it. And so the big question is going to be about encountering God moments, which isn't the only you know, theme of the talk, but is certainly part of it. Um, and we're going to read today <laughs> from the Psalms. I didn't get the word 19 in there. We're going to read from Psalm 19 from the message. So today I want to mix it up a little bit and just do joys and concerns first. That is really one of the most important parts of what we do. It's different, I know, since we're on virtual. Um, you know, last time I talked so much, we barely left any time, and, and I was just reminded of how important it is. So we're going to start there, um, and then I'll open us up with prayer. I'll pause the, the recording. Uh, so then we'll read Psalm 19, and we're going to talk about um, your big, the big question is going to be your God encounter, encounter moments, and um, then I'll share that chapel talk, and that's probably the plan. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pause the recording. Back to the slideshow. All right. Okay, so we've had some joys and concerns and said a prayer. So <laughs> I actually put this picture up there. <laughs> we have another slab leak. Uh, so <laughs> we had we've had we haven't had any hot water on our front on our ground floor for the last week. And the guy who originally came, they, they didn't find it in the right spot. So they dug this big hole. It wasn't there. <laughs> now they've dug another hole. So anyway, our son has moved upstairs with us uh, into his uh, younger, his, our middle daughter's room. And anyway, so we can <laughs> pray for the, the plumbers that we're going to get that all, all resolved. Um, all right. Bible verse. Let's open up to Psalm 19. I'm going to include in the, the little chapel talk that I want to share. Um, the, the first verse of Psalm 19, but I want to go ahead and read the whole thing, and I'm going to go ahead and read it from the message. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit in, about several things about God encounters, and I know that sometimes, well, Oklahoma is a fantastic place to see sunrises and sunsets and to see God's glory reflected in the sky, and Psalm 19 is definitely one of my favorite psalms that... Um, that reflects on that. So this is what uh, David wrote in Psalm 19, as interpreted by Eugene Peterson in The Message. God's glory is on tour in the skies, God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes every morning, Professor Knight lectures each evening. Their words aren't heard, their voices aren't recorded, but their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. The morning sun's a new husband, leaping from his honeymoon bed, the daybreaking sun, an athlete racing to the tape. That's how God's word vaults across the skies, from sunrise to sunset, melting ice, scorching deserts, warming hearts to faith. The revelation of God is whole and pulls our lives together. The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. The directions of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's reputation is 24 karat gold with a lifetime guarantee. The decisions of God are accurate down to the nth degree. God's word is better than a diamond, better than a diamond set between emeralds. 
You'll like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red, ripe strawberries. There's more. God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way or know when we play the fool? Clean the slate, God, so we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins, from thinking I can take over your work. Then I can start this day sun-washed, scrubbed clean of the grime of sin. These are the words of my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. O oh God, my altar rock, God, priest of my altar. So, um, the big question today is going to be, when have you encountered God? And of course, we have opportunities every day to encounter God. And <clears throat> I'm a little better as an adult than I was as a young man. <laughs> I'm setting aside time to uh, have a morning prayer and, and you know, listen to a meditation, read verses. Um, but th that is still something that I know I need to be challenged to do. And it would be very good for me to do that every single day. Uh, some of you may, may be um, more successful in that, in, in starting every day with some scripture and with a reminder of uh, God's promises. We have to spend time with people um, in order to have relationship with them. Uh, we have to spend time with God in order to know God. Uh, I mean, God knows us, <laughs> whether we some, spend time with him or not. But for us to get to know God, we have to spend time with him. And sometimes we have these moments that, you know, for, for different reasons, tend to be more memorable or sort of a peak moment in terms of encountering God. So that's kind of what I want you to think about um, a little bit that I'll give you a chance to talk. We'll talk together. We may just stay together as a big group um, at the end of today's lesson. In terms of church announcements, there's a little bit, well, anyway, I won't, I won't add a commentary, but I'll just say today, for those of us, for those who are attending church, um, they're starting a new multi-generational uh, engage opportunity uh, at the filling station there in, in the Great Hall um, at 10 a.m. And I guess we skipped, um, we skipped January. So the monthly newsletter is, is back on schedule and it's actually the, the February issue is out. And so the women's Bible ministry is featured. Um, and I think the men's ministry, because I was part of a couple of conversations, I think they're going to have an article maybe in March about our Friday morning men's group. Um, but anyway, that is continues to be a great way to, to keep not only track of what's happening in the life of the church, but sometimes get a little more of a deep dive into a particular ministry uh, or some particular stories. And Blair Merkel is doing a great job with that. Our Wednesday nights continue, and um, those are our meals. And let's see, pulled pork chicken on a bun, if you would want to have that, is going to be the meal this week. Um, and then also, if you are aware of anyone who has preschool age children, uh, this is really great. Um, the families of, of church members at FPC have priority enrollment for our preschool. And I know that is a pretty big deal because those waiting lists can get long. So that's coming up on February 7th and 8th. So if you happen to, to know anyone fitting in that category, you can contact Mary Singleton at the church. So what I would like to do now is I'm going to pause the recording again um, and just invite us to share about a meaningful or memorable Valentine's Day memory. Um, I put a little logo of this story worth up here because uh, I guess it was last year, <clears throat> we gave story worth to my dad, um, which he has absolutely loved. Both my parents are now 80, and it is a website that will send the person who you've given this to a question, and I think he does it weekly, but he writes these answers, and they are e actually emailed to the different members of our family, and you can click and see the ones he's done before, and then at the end of this year, um, we can actually print and have a little book. And so there's there's a lot of little questions um, about a lot of things. This is kind of this reminded me a little bit of a story worth kind of question. And the different people who are sort of who, who are following him have a chance to suggest their own questions or, um, you know, change a question and he can write his own questions. It's just really, really awesome. Um, anyway, this this kind of reminded me of it a little bit today. So I'm going to pause our recording. Okay. All right, here we go. And again, 
switch over. All right, thank you all for sharing some Valentine's memories. Um, what I am going to share here is just basically the the chapel talk that that I gave this week, and <clears throat> we have required chapel at Cassidy School. It is an Episcopal day school. It's interesting because you know I grew up Presbyterian, uh, and so my introduction to Episcopalianism, I guess, was you know coming to Cassidy in 2015. And it is a very, it typically is a very traditional service with, with hymns and liturgy, um, but our, our school is very diverse and, and it's different, you know, it's, it's, it's not Presbyterian, um, but I do really enjoy the chances, especially when different faculty or staff, and it doesn't happen that often, will share a chapel talk. And, and it'll be about different things. And sometimes it's about people's life or their experiences. Anyway, that's... Um, it, I just enjoy those. And so <laughs> in past years, when I was the director of technology, except for one time, my chapel talks were all like, don't make dumb choices with your technology kids, because we talked about what we termed the responsible use policy. And, you know, it was that, that kind of a presentation. So um, I think maybe my first year I had shared a chapel talk, but, but this, this was in, in large part, the, the whole reason we're in this class there's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons uh, behind it. And I think God, it was working on me for quite a while about this, but a part of that was our own children and especially our youngest daughter at school and how it seemed like the presentation of science was really one or the other. Um, and so I took this picture uh, this last year on the 31st of August. I have probably seen beautiful rainbows, maybe I don't know if it's less than 10, but not that many times in my life. And I certainly haven't had a chance to capture them. And so <clears throat> this is on our campus. Hey, Wes, we're not yeah. seeing the picture. All we're seeing is your Google. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, thanks. That, uh, at least I'm not muted. You know, that, that happens during remote learning too, where it's like. There you go. You just what? passed it. We're back to Google homepage again. Yep. Hang on. Oh, sorry, folks. Okay. You got it. How about that? Better. Do, do you see a rainbow now? Yes, we see a rainbow. Yay. Thank you, wife Shelly, for helping me not look like a fool or maybe just correcting me at least when I am. Okay. So I took this picture on August the 31st. This is on the, uh, the Cassie campus. We've got a lake in the middle of our campus. Uh, we have 80 acres and this is looking to... So it's looking towards Walmart. So I guess that's looking south. Um, and this was before a storm was moving in. There's actually a double rainbow. Um, let's see if I can get my fancy little laser here. Um, so this was the double. And I think you could even at times see the triple. This was, a, this was before school. And it was one of those just kind of magical moments where I was just at the right place at the right time. And as it kind of moved, it just transformed and it was just beautiful. So that, there's our chapel, there's a rainbow. And so a powerful symbol of God's promises. And also, you know, for me, understanding a little bit more of the science of the world really deepens my awe and appreciation for God. So thinking about the sun millions of miles away, you know, having nuclear explosions that create light and that light, you know, intersecting at just the right angle to these water droplets, which are falling through the sky, refracting into the colors of the rainbow. And then this rainbow moving across Oklahoma city and, you know, just moving right over our chapel. That was really a cool moment. So another pretty neat moment like this a bit for me um, happened in 2009. I, I have 2007 on that slide and it was it was two years after the iPhone came out because I was I took uh, this this video with my iPhone 3G, but I had a chance to go back to New Zealand. I had been an exchange student there in 1987 for the summer. Uh, this is Rotorua and this is a volcano. This is the caldera of Rotorua. And so we are coming in from Auckland um, to land in Rotorua, uh, which is one of the most uh, active locations for geothermal um, Act, act, uh, geothermal features. So geysers, hot springs, um, you know, bubbling mud pots, Yellowstone Park, which is right outside of Powell, where my dad grew up in Wyoming, you know, is a big, big spot for that. But also um, Iceland, um, Hawaii, you know, is a hot spot, but it doesn't really have the geothermal. 
but this was an amazing time. I've, you know, I've flown a few planes because uh, I was in pilot training for a while. And, you know, that, that, that's a pretty amazing experience. But when you're controlling the plane, and especially you're learning, your fear factor is a little bit different than when you're just riding. So I've had a few experiences like this, looking out the window, especially in the clouds, right? Because that's so cool. Well, you don't fit, sense the speed of a plane unless you're landing, you, you would happen to be passing someone else, which hopefully doesn't happen, you know, at close, close quarters. But when you're in the clouds, you really do. And so that was really an amazing moment where I was like, man, look at this amazing world that, you know, God has created. And I knew also about these, um, these geysers and, and hot spots and things that we were, or hot pools that we were going to get to see. Um, this is another kind of amazing picture. I took this one at Cassidy. And this is why I read Psalm 19. Um, I think this is the NIV version that reads, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. This is a sculpture that is just outside our chapel. So we're kind of on the opposite side of the lake where I took those rainbow pictures was across where our middle school or middle division is. And that's where I teach and spend most of my time. Um, this little, not little, this big sculpture um, has characters in multiple languages and i think that and i should have gotten this exact but they're they're characters that spell the name of god in all of these different languages um but anyway we just you know have spectacular sunrises and sunsets from time to time and it's really a bonus because <laughs> i don't always get, get up early and go outside and so um you know sometimes how for tall school, is that uh, sculpture west say that again how tall uh it's taller than me so it may be you know 10 feet tall or something like that eight to, okay. yeah it's 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 a pretty pretty tall one it, they brought it in on a huge crane i think maybe the second year that i was there um it's actually one of the only things that has a camera on it at our campus that if you get too close to it it emails somebody it's, we got a special surveillance trigger uh that's on it um but you know it is uh it's one of the best things, I think. There's a lot of great things about living in Oklahoma, but we have fantastic sunrises and sunsets. And I'm reminded at times like that of how, of course, amazing God is and the beauty of this world, but also how good it is to be out in God's world and God's creation and to, um, you know, be able to to experience it. A lot of times, you know, we're indoors, we're, we're uh you know, maybe we have a window, but it's not like you have the heavens, you know, lit up like this. And uh, those are those are good moments. <clears throat> so the presentation for the, the kids was really to tell a story about the journey of this class and some of my own journey in thinking about God and and science. The picture on the left was in the fall of 1991 when I was at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Uh, you know, that might have been right when I soloed actually in this uh, T-41. It's a Cessna 172. And you have to do that before you, you know, go on to pilot training to fly jets. Um, when I was in college, I, like some people, you, you know, you can't generalize, but there's a number of folks that may have been in the church and then in college, especially as you are exposed to and you take a lot of science, you know, even though I majored in political science and geography, I took like one of every engineering <laughs> and I had, you know, I took calculus, I took biology, I took chemistry, um, and I took like 10 engineering classes, um, which I all, which I did pass them all, which was really good. Uh, but, but, you know, there is a very secular presentation of the, the, the creation of the world and the understanding of the world in most science classes. And so it wasn't until later, and that picture on the right is actually Rachel's birthday when she turned 16, uh, in 2019. You know, it wasn't until later in life that I think I really started to understand how both a scientific mindset and, and an understanding of science can be complementary rather than being, you know, completely separate. And so um, in this presentation, and I just realized that I don't have a watch, so I'm going to have to I got 15 minutes. Okay. Um, Shelly, maybe you could bring me, if you don't mind, uh, like an iPad or something, because I, I didn't bring my watch and I have nothing else to, oh, wait a minute. I've got a, I have one. I'm good. Sorry. Uh, I want to share three pitfalls, three books, and three lessons uh, in, in terms of trying to kind of organize these thoughts. And before sh sharing those, 
I mentioned this picture. Um, does uh, anybody have memories of Apollo 8 in 1968? That was when the astronauts were orbiting and they read from Genesis. Um, anybody remember that? Um, I, I see Jerry's hand. Um, this picture is called Earth, Earthrise and it just happened. I think it might have been Jim Lovell who was on the, was the um, commander. They, of course, they didn't land in 1968. Um, they were orbiting, but just happened to point his camera out the window um, as they were coming, coming around the moon. And there was the earth, this blue marble, you know, rising up in the blackness of space. This particular image has become a symbol of the environmental movement throughout the world over time to me. And I have this actually on the lock screen of my iPhone. It's a reminder of both how small we are in the, in the vast ex expanse of space, but how special we are. And it also just really blows my mind to think that the God who created this incredible planet with all of the life and with all of the complexity, I mean, think of human life, think of any life that is, that, that, you know, matter and dust that, that comes into, into life that he would have a relationship with us and that he would have a way to be able to connect with us. I didn't share that, that part in my chapel talk that, but um, anyway, there's a whole lot of, of thoughts that come to my mind uh, with this kind of an image. So the first thing I wanted to share were, were what I called three pitfalls. And by pitfall, I mean a trap, something that you step in, something that you, you know, fall into, it's something you don't want to be in. Um, and I have fallen in to varying degrees to these pitfalls. And the first pitfall I've already really referenced and mentioned, and that is that our culture seems to portray faith and science as separate choices. You know, either you are a scientist or you are a Christian. You can't do both. Um, I, I changed my presentation a little bit, junior high or middle school versus our high schoolers. I didn't mention this for the middle schoolers, but you know, Richard Dawkins is a very, very vocal atheist and um, outspoken um, advocate for, a, for this position, you know, that you can't have both. And he really lampoons and makes fun of Christians. I have not seen it, but there's a debate, and maybe there's more than one, but at least one debate on YouTube between the author of our book, um, Dr. John C. Lennox of Oxford, with Dawkins, you know, talking about the existence of God. And I think that one of the most important messages if, if, of all that I wanted to try and share with our students, and that I want to, you know, share with us and us to, to dive into is how not everyone believes like Dawkins does, Dawkins does, um, who is a scientist? There are scientists, and, and I wouldn't consider myself, I'm not a professional scientist, I'm an educator, but I'm certainly someone who loves science and embraces science. Um, not everybody follows what Dawkins portrays. And this idea, and this is fairly new in the history of humanity as well, because for centuries, I mean, since science really started with the, in, in the time of the Enlightenment, <clears throat> or at least how we know science today, as far as empiricism and, you know, exper experimental um, procedures and scientific method, all of that. You know, many, many scientists throughout history have been people of faith, uh, believers in God, and some also believers in Jesus as the resurrected um, son of God. Um, so I would say these are not mutually exclusive. And that'd, that'd be like the number one reason for this class. And I think it's it's, it's important at multiple levels, not just for kids. It's, it's important for adults too. And so the message here is that you can choose to be both a follower of the resurrected Jesus Christ and a scientist, a believer in science. And it's interesting with the language that we choose. I could have chosen a, a language here that was a lot more of just a person of faith, but I think it's important to say a follower of the resurrected Jesus Christ because, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a theist meaning he believed in God, um, but he wasn't a believer in that Jesus Christ was the son of God, that he performed miracles and, you know, that he, he died on the cross and rose again. The Jefferson Bible took all the miracles out of, of the Bible and, and tried to leave the moral teaching, but take all of the supernatural out. And as followers of Jesus, if we read the scriptures, uh, 
you know, I believe it's, it's unmistakable that Jesus Christ performed miracles when he was here on earth. Um, and he, he both did supernatural things and then lived a supernatural life through resurrection. So pitfall number two, um, this is something that comes from that first book that we studied last year, which was the language of God. And um, the author of the language of God, who I'm going to mention, I think I've got his picture. Oh, I got his picture coming up here in a minute. Um, the God in the gaps theology would say, you know, as God gets bigger, or sorry, as science gets bigger, God gets smaller. And sort of the, the conception of God here is the things we don't understand, the things that are mysterious are God. But then science is everything else. And this is a real pitfall because, you know, science continues to, to march on and we have more and more insight into uh, how life works, you know, biologically in the, in the microscopic, but also, you know, the heavens, you know, the universe. Um, this would be a God in the gaps pitfall. And so my point would be that God in his domain um, certainly do not have to get smaller as science and technology advance. Um, we talked about, you know, Galileo and Darwin quite a bit last year and a little bit about Einstein. Um, Rosalind Franklin, if you're not familiar with her, uh, was one of the foremost scientists that helped, um, fig, you know, discover DNA code and the genetic sequence. And then these are two names that, especially with COVID, we may not have heard, but Emmanuel Charpentier, who is a French scientist, and then Jennifer Doudna, who is a U.S. scientist. They were both awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of CRISPR, which is a gene editing technology that uses Cas9 to literally with scissors, you know, snip parts of the DNA code and then allow that code to be repaired. Uh, first time two women have ever shared a Nobel Prize. Not all of these people are Christians. You know, Darwin grew up at, at, in a Christian family and, and, and moved away. Galileo, you know, was excommunicated, had to recant. But, you know, all as science has, has marched forward, there have been a lot of different ways that people have, you know, theologically responded. Um, and, and my message is that we certainly don't have to just respond by seeing that God is, gets smaller. Um, my third pitfall is arrogance. I think it's really important to maintain humility. Sometimes we might portray science as, as having it all figured out. You know, we, we talked last year about dark matter. Rick, Rick Roberts did uh, a little bit as well. I know he's researched and knows a lot more, I think, about astronomy and, and these things maybe than any of us in our class do. But we think that over half of the known universe today is composed of dark matter, which is something we don't even know what it is. We're trying to detect it. You know, the universe is continuing to expand, and the people that do math at a much higher level than I ever will, you know, have said these calculations only work when there's more mass than we can see. Um, Hebrews 4.16, the author wrote, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help uh, to help in time of need. I think we want to be coming to God with our curiosities and with our questions and our desire to understand. Um, and we want to come boldly with those questions to him. But at the same time, I don't think we're called to have at all an arrogant spirit. Um, we are never, in my, uh, my opinion, going to be completely comprehending God or completely comprehending the universe. We understand it a lot more and a lot with a lot greater depth than we have before. Um, but, you know, those who believe they know it all, those who present particularly science at, or, or even religion, um, because even, even in the things that we do know and we understand, God is bigger and the mysteries of God are greater, you know, than our, than our brains are ever going to fully comprehend. Um, God is big enough to handle all of our questions. And so this is a verse from John, the gospel of John chapter 14, starting in verse 25. And these are the words of Jesus because they're in, they're in red here. All I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You know, this gift of the Holy Spirit and this promise that as we bring our questions to God, we seek him in his word, we seek him through prayer, and we seek him through fellowship with other believers. What an incredible supernatural 
promise that is that God is going to help us understand and will reveal these things to us. Um, that is something that I, I think is very strong in our reform tradition as, as, you know, in the lineage of Martin Luther. And as you look at how denominations and, and, and the Christian uh, traditions and faith traditions developed, um, I really think this is an important part of our understanding of God and his nature and also how we are to, to learn and encounter God you know, is, in, is inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So three books. Um, book number one, this is our first book we did last, last year by Francis Collins, um, The Language of God. The, Collins, as many of you will recall, was the leader of the Human Genome Project that successfully mapped the human genome. And he came to faith as an adult. He didn't grow up in a Christian family or a, a very religious family. Um, and a lot of the influence on him was really the writing of C.S. Lewis. Um, he is currently still the director of the National Institutes of Health. Um, he's on Twitter with 162,000 followers. And he doesn't share many religious things right on his channel, but I really appreciate the articulation that he provided in that book for his faith and for the way that his, uh, his uh, awe for God, and, and, and he is not only a theist believing in God, he is a follower of Jesus Christ and a believer in the resurrected Jesus. Um, I think it's just fantastic to have him as an example and a model and to share him with, with not just young people, but with everyone to say, look, we have scientists who are super, super smart and they're not rejecting faith and rejecting um, belief. Um, the second book I recommended was ours that we're doing this, this year, uh, 2084 by John Lennox. And Professor Lennox, I found through that, um, that Harvard project, the Veritas Forum that brings together academics, professors, uh, medical professionals, um, all kinds of folks to share about the intersection of their faith with their profession. Um, and then, you know, this was a quotation from a lesson earlier this year when we were talking about chapter seven, and it was a quotation of Max Tegmark. Tegmark is a, a major researcher on artificial intelligence, and a couple of the scenarios that tag, tag, Tegmark uh, projects for artificial intelligence have the word God in their title. And so Linux says, we cannot avoid talking about God. And we talk about the future and AI and these things that are being designed. Um, we really need to understand sort of our history and where we came from and our relationship to God, you know, because we have people that are, are creating products and platforms that have quote, God-like, you know, capabilities in terms of surveillance and in terms of, um, you know, their ability to have insight into what we're doing and even manipulate us, pull our strings, things like that. So last book uh, was really The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but Mere Christianity. A lot of the kids have read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, not everyone necessarily realizes that C.S. Lewis um, was and remains a luminary of, Christ of Christian apologetics. And that doesn't mean apologizing for Christianity. It means explaining, articulating, sharing with, with, with the people the truth of the gospel. Um, and so mere Christianity is a fantastic articulation of Christianity in really plain language. And interestingly, it, has, it influenced both John Lennox, the, the author of our book we're studying this year, and then also um, it was a big influence on um, uh, Collins, Francis Collins, who wrote The Language of God. Um, this is a little screenshot of the website for the Veritas Forum. Um, we had our one of our eco leaders come and, and preach to us a couple of years ago, and I just asked him after the service, hey, thank you. Thinking about teaching this class, any suggestions? And he said, well, you have to check out the Veritas Forum from Harvard. What is that? <laughs> and so as you are even interested in, in learning more about, you know, faith and Christianity and, and also contemporary issues, the intersection between contemporary issues and faith, uh, it really is a fantastic website with videos and podcasts and, and also, you know, authors who speak and we can read their books and, and gain, you know, additional insight. So finally, uh, three lessons. Uh, the first one I shared was that Genesis matters. Shelly cautioned me about that picture and thought the kids would think that was really funny. Um, but if it makes us think about Genesis, that's good. Um, I used to think that Genesis was more of a story and it wasn't really maybe as important, but as we've particularly just done our study the last year and a half, Genesis is vital, understanding not only 
you know, where we came from, but our relationship to God. These are things that we can't learn in the lab. The laboratory and empiric, empiricist, you know, experiment can, can disprove something. It can, you know, support a theory and it can help us, you know, deepen our understanding. But I don't believe that is where we're going to understand our relationship to God. And, and, and Genesis has a very important role to play in that. Um, our complex universe was not an accident. Um, that's a picture of our middle daughter, Sarah, when she was born in 2000, you know, just over 20 years ago uh, in Lubbock, Texas. You know, whether we're talking about the miracle of birth or the background image here is the Hubble deep field, which we could do a whole lesson on and maybe we should. This was taken in 1995 in a very small part of a constellation called Ursa Major, which we may know better as the Big Dipper, a really small part of the Big Dipper. And every light, and this was like over 300 images put together over time, every bit of light in this deep field image, which I'm not even showing the whole thing, was not a moon, not a planet, not a star, a galaxy. There's over 3,000 galaxies, and those are just visible ones in this really, really tiny, kind of like a, you know, if you took a rifle scope and looked through it, you know, up at the sky, like that kind of small part you know, 3,000 galaxies. Wow, we are part of an immense universe that was not an accident. Um, and, and that, I think that is really good news, especially when it's understood in the context of Jesus. So really smart people, including scientists, and not just old white guys, that's super important, also believe Jesus Christ was the son of God. Francis Collins, uh, John Lennox, C.S. Lewis, um, but, but there's a, a great Christianity Today article that I found from February of 2020 called 12 Christian Women in Science You Should Know. And so um, um, archaeologists like Mary Schweitzer, um, I think biochemists like uh, Georgia Dunstan, there's a lot of people. And so I think the portrayal in popular culture that, oh, Richard Dawkins, and you're just either an atheist or a scientist, that so misses reality. And this is a very important thing for us to share with students and, and also with, with everybody. So um, I'm going to go ahead and have to wrap up because I think I've just come a little off the top of the hour. Uh, but this was my closing little video that I shared. This is a, a six-year-old video um, that was from the McGovern Institute in MIT. And it's a simulation that is showing how CRISPR works in terms of the DNA code. And, you know, the vaccine, there's a, there's a conspiracy theory and a false you know, misinformation that it's being spread around today that, oh, if you get the vaccine, you're, you know, your, your, your uh, DNA is going to be edited. Your genetics are going to be changed. And that's not true. The, the vaccines, the Pfizer, the Moderna vaccine, they don't alter the DNA of our bodies. Um, what, what it is, and I'll sound like I know what I'm talking about because I've just done a little bit of research and stayed at a Holiday Inn Express a long time ago before COVID. The, the, the vaccines put a messenger RNA uh, inside our, our bodies that tell our cells how to produce the antibodies. This simulation is different. This is a, is a simulation of CRISPR. And so what's being injected here into the cell is literally going to act like scissors. It's going to cut a specific part of the DNA apart, and then it is going to provide an opportunity for that to be uh, for enzymes that are close to it to heal and to, and to repair it. This blows my mind, right? But it also suggests some important things. Number one, you know, DNA is literally information. There is so much information encoded and there's so much, you know, processing power and capability in our brains. It is going to be a long time before, you know, we're able to, to even replicate the kinds of, in, of, of things that, that the human body can do and that we find in the human body. But how important is it that we have ethical and moral scientists and elected leaders and appointed officials and business leaders, everyone involved thinking about the morality of this, the ethics of this, and how should this be used? Because this kind of technology has the promise of curing genetic diseases. But of course, in the hands of someone who would want to harm and would want to hurt, um, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was written in like the 1800s. It's crazy to think about what could be done by someone who wanted to do harm and use technology in this way to do that. So 
I think, and this is kind of my last last thought here, um, that we need to continue to pursue these questions together. And, and I appreciate you all being on this journey um, with me uh, together in this class. It is something that I don't think we're gonna run out of stuff to talk about. Um, to me, it's really inspiring to, to be able to, to learn more about science, but I think what's also so important and we try to do every week is to open up God's word, to, to meditate on his scripture and to consider what that scripture is saying to us and finding ways in which, um, you know, we're, there's very specific things that God wants us to do. And God wants us to bring our questions. He wants us to, to bring, um, you know, the reality of where we are in our life, you know, to bring that to him and, and offer that up to him. And I've gone over five minutes. So uh, we got to have some earlier talk time and I, I did joys and concerns first so that we'd be able to, to get through those. So um, let me stop sharing here. And I want to guess I want to close this with a prayer. Let me just do that. I'll close this with prayer. And we'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit, the gifts of your creation. Um, thank you for the minds that you have given us that, that's, that have questions, God, that uh, are finite, but um, we, we're grateful for the ways in which you've, you've given us each other and you've given us your word and Jesus. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would walk with us this week. Thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for our church. Help us to walk with you and to draw closer to your son, Jesus, and to be more like him today and in the week to come. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.